I have a little secret. This is my first ever session for Worship You. And I'm so happy it's with you guys. You're just, you're very handsome, all of you. I mean that in a girl and a guy kind of way, so it's fine. Um, okay, so real quick, um, they say when you speak, you should build a little rapport. So I'm gonna just tell you some quick things about myself and we'll jump in, okay? So this is me building rapport. Um, uh, I am a firstborn pastor's kid from the Midwest. Okay, here's the thing. Start to psychoanalyze now because every single one of those stereotypes are probably true. It's about all you need to know about me, okay? So there's the package deal. Um, I married a genius and he's here today, you guys. Andrew, can you stand up? You have a computer. There he is. You guys, this man, he is so beautiful. He's so beautiful. He has literally laid his life down for me to see my dreams happen. He looks like Jesus, a whole lot like Jesus. Find someone like him, be someone like him. Seriously, he's amazing. Um, so I am very happily married, and I'm a pastor in the second year school of ministry. If you're not thinking about doing the school of ministry yet, you will and you should, okay? Are we clear on that? Good, good, good. You guys are a little quiet, but you'll get there, I promise. Um, so today we're gonna talk about silencing the inner critic. Uh, we're under the canopy of songwriting, but this applies in a lot of areas. Um, so rapport building time is over, that was it, and we're just gonna jump in. So, do you guys trust me? Do you feel trust with me? Great, just from that little bit, cool. Um, so we're gonna start, uh, I'm actually gonna play a song real quick, just through the back. I encourage you, you know, put your notes down, close your eyes, and just get, get in the zone, okay? You with me? All right. Hit it, boys. I've always wanted to say that. Always, always. Okay, close your eyes. Get in the zone. We're just going to play something real quick here. Can we just play that other one really quick too? Stay in the moment. You guys don't have to look at me. Stay in the moment, right? Yeah, you're getting moved. What if these songs were never finished? Think about some of your favorite songs. Think about the ones that shaped music. What if they were never completed? What if the Beatles never really got to that chorus, all you need is love? What would we sing at hockey games if Queen didn't finish, we are the champion? What would we sing? <laughs> would Titanic have even been a movie? <laughs> if my heart will go on, wasn't written, wasn't finished. Think about these things, guys. Hey, what if the Sistine Chapel had never been completed? What if Van Gogh, Picasso, and Dali became frustrated and they quit? They don't want to be misunderstood anymore, okay? So what if the Mona Lisa never got her smile? And what if the statue of David remained in the heart of the artist and never got out? 
How would that change art? What if Shakespeare quit when he hit writer's block? What if the pyramids didn't have a peak to them? And if, what if the Great Wall of China wasn't so great? What if you don't finish the songs inside of you? What if the calling of God in you never got out of you? What would the world look like? How many of you guys have half written songs? Specifically because of discouragement, insecurity, doubt, and fear. How many of you have works of art that have been short-circuited because of inner critics? Yeah, yeah, I think some of us maybe. What keeps us from finishing it? What keeps us from creating, from writing? Sure, a lack of drive can do it, laziness, apathy, but I don't think God makes lazy people. I don't think God makes apathetic people. I think there's something deeper. There was for me, there is for me. There's a resistance that was lying to me, attempting with what little power it had to get me to agree with it because then it had a voice. It crops up whenever we embark in something new, important, powerful, and beautiful, and by definition, songwriting is that, right? There's this quote, there's a book out right now called The War of Art, and it's so good. Um, Pressfield said, the more scared we are of a work or calling, the more sure we are that we have to do it. It's so funny, I was preparing for this message and there's these words echoing in my mind over and over and I'm like, okay, shh, I'm trying to work, trying to write, trying to work, trying to write. This was a voice worth listening to uh, and eventually I did. And it's actually just the echo of Jesus' final words. Remember them? He's hanging on a tree, bleeding out. And his last words, before he gives up his spirit, three words, it is finished. See, Jesus had a call and a purpose in his life. He had something inside of him that was meant to get out. The father placed there, right? I'm shaking. It's just, sorry, you guys, it's fine if you notice, it's okay. I'm just a little nervous. <laughs> so, so the father put something inside of him and his last words was, I did it, I finished it. So I think finishing matters. And I think if Jesus made a way to do it, then we, then we can too, right? Okay. I had such a sense preparing for this session. Sometimes we have good information and that's really important, really, really important. But as I was writing, I couldn't escape the feeling that the Lord actually wanted to come in and break cycles and patterns of thoughts that have been there, actually identifying ones that you thought were just normal that you thought were just like normal and that everyone feels and they're just gonna stay there and maybe we'll battle them down, but it's kind of always gonna be there. Today it ends. I actually feel such a sense of breakthrough that the Lord wants to release. And you know how I know that? Is actually, just to be really honest with you, preparing for this message was pretty hard for me because I had a whole lot of chirping voices, a whole lot of inner critics talking about this. And so if my main point is, important things you gotta fight for, then I think the session's important. So I just wanna let you know that because there's something in the spirit, something in the air that there is to grab onto where these things get to end today. You're not just gonna get good information. You're not just gonna hear my story, but these patterns are gonna stop, okay? Sound good? So before we even go on, I wanna ready, like I don't wanna just be listening here. These are nice for listening, but we actually want like our guts engaged, okay? Like in so much of it, uh, so much of it is what we catch, what we're watching for or waiting for. So we're just gonna open up our spirits to receive on all these different levels. So just pray with me real quick. God, we invite you to come and actually change things. God, we don't wanna just talk about this. We don't wanna talk about resistance and glorify it even, we want it to be done today. So God, we just talk about it to draw attention, to say we see you and you have no power left anymore. So we just engage our spirits. God, we ready ourselves. We know that in a moment, because you said it is finished, it can be finished. God, we lay down the pride of thinking that we need to process everything for it to be good and done because some days you just get the breakthrough just because he gave it to you. So God, we just ready ourselves for breakthrough. In the name of Jesus. Okay. So uh, my story, to be honest, Everbee was the first song I had ever finished. 
Uh, I just remember growing up and like hearing interviews from people I just like looked up to so much, you know, writers and um, lyricists and they would get interviewed and uh, the question is always there, when did you, when did you first um, start writing? It's cute, which is like hair in the mouth. When did you start writing? And the answer is like, oh, I think I was like between three and four months and I wrote my first melody. I looked up from the bottle, I pushed it aside and this song came out. And since I've written tens of thousands of songs. And what it did for me is I, I thought, well, if I was a songwriter, I probably would have started a long time ago. I haven't written any songs, so I'm probably not qualified. So no, I'm not a writer. And it stole from me for a long time. Any of you guys agree with that? Yeah? Okay, I don't like that. That's a dumb lying voice. Um, that's one that stops today. So I think I was just really afraid to try something and fail because deep down I wanted it so badly. Um, and so anyway, I'm in a worship set that's two hours long and we are an hour and a half in. So folks, I'll do, I'll do the math for you. I'm very good at math. Um, that's a half hour left, okay? And we have no more songs to go. And I would love to say that I like wrote the chorus of Ever Be out of this like very divine moment, but actually I was like freaked out a little bit and just, we have to finish this set. We need to, there's a, there's a finish line and we have to keep running till we get there. And so I'm like, okay, uh, something repeatable. What is it? What is it? Uh, and this phrase pops out of my mind. And there it is. Uh, your praise will be on my lips. Something like that. And uh, it did the trick. It got me to the end of the set. So I was thankful and I didn't think anything of it. So then uh, fast forward a couple months. I'm here in school, the school of ministry. I'm leading a set and there's a down moment. And I kind of remember that chorus out of the blue. So I start singing it and I have a friend right about here. <laughs> and so I start singing it and he looks up at me and he over mouths. Like, I don't know why I was looking at him when he's doing this, um, but he, he mouths, did you write that? Is that a song? And I'm like, a little busy. I'm a little busy right now, but <laughs> no, I don't know. We, can we talk later? Um, but that wasn't like it. That wasn't the end of that question because it kind of caught on. It started to be sung a little bit. And so friends would ask like, hey, is that yours? Have you written that? And my answer was, no, no, I don't write. But I would worship to it because I was moved by it. Uh, and the bridge one day just popped out pretty quickly too. So then I started to freak out because I actually loved it and I was attached to it and I had a bit of a vision for it, um, but I'm not a writer. I don't even like saying it, I am a writer. At the moment, I thought I wasn't a writer. Um, so Bethel Music had me start writing with a guy named Gabe Wilson. Uh, he started coaching, he's amazing, started kind of coaching me and I came in with the chorus and bridge and about 12 not great attempts at a verse. Um, and Gabe simply asked me what I wanted to say. And I felt immediate beautiful conviction, not guilt, but the kind that actually changes you and motivates you. And what became clear to me that day is I didn't know. I didn't know what I wanted to say. It's not that I didn't have things to say. Um, it was just cloudy and compacted in my chest. It wasn't processed yet. And I wasn't present to who I was that day, who God was to me, and why I'll always praise him. See, I had good reasons. I just didn't have good words yet. So then he encouraged me to begin writing, not for songs, not unto lyrics, or for beautiful things, but to find myself. And then the Lord whispered to me, these verses will be the canvas I paint on. I'll bring healing to you through them. So the chorus and the bridge were a freebie. The Lord is very tricky. He had a little glimmer in his eye. He gave me these freebies so that I could work through some of this stuff and face down some loud voices inside me for those, for those verses. I had to mine out the complex emotions and experiences that I hadn't yet come to terms with or processed. I had to combat lies that kept me quiet and feeling disqualified from my calling. And I had to expose and turn off the soundtrack of negative thinking in the voice of the inner critic. So this all sounds beautiful and romantic now, but it was actually pretty in the trenches and nitty gritty. Um, there are critical voices, there are insecurities. I didn't even know I felt until that moment. Chris Valentin has this quote, it's so epic. Ready? They all are from him, they all are. The dogs of doom stand at the doorway of destiny. How Lord of the Rings is that? But the thing is, it's true when those dogs bark loudly. But the thing is, the louder the bark, the louder your voice is meant to ride over on top of it. So with lungs growing strong to shout out and drown out the enemy voice, 
It's a telltale sign like that when we're bullied. So take heart. In the words of my beloved Christine DeMarco, oh, Callie, you're just getting screamed at because those voices are about to die. So today, some voices are about to die. Sound good? Okay, um, so why does this all matter what we think? You know, we, sometimes we talk about spiritual warfare in very um, elaborate, like, medieval terms. Have you noticed that? Um, I don't know. Maybe just me. Never mind. It's, like, kind of mystical. The thing is, most warfare happens between here and here. It's what you think. It's what you think about yourself, what you think about God, what you think about the world around you, your past, your present, your future. See, they talk about visualization as... Um, uh, <laughs> They say athletes, which I am very athletic myself. Thank you, Jeremy. Was that a laugh? Was that a thank you? Oh, Joshua, that was a laugh. I'm not, I'm not. So it's ironic I'm talking about this. They say athletes um, do these visualization exercises. They go out on the court, they do the drills, but, but what they do is they actually will, will practice by closing their eyes and picturing themselves. Ready for my dribble? Look at this form, guys. Look at this form. And they, and they visualize themselves, yeah, huh? <laughs> I told you, I warned you all. They visualize themselves doing free throws and nailing it every single time, and actually it shows it works. It affects their play. And I wanna propose the way that you visualize your life and yourself affects your play too. So what we think is very, very, very important. Hebrews 10, 39 says, we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we are those who believe and are saved. So today we're not shrinking back. What we do is we cast down every high and lofty thing that sets itself up against the knowledge of truth. Guys, that's fighting words. That's like MMA where we take a lie and we like throw it over our knee and we cast it down, right? Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna share with you a couple of the lies along the way that I have believed in, and I want you to have like that kind of warring posture. We're casting down, okay? If this is something that you've experienced in your own life, we're gonna, we're gonna see an end to it. Um, I'm gonna hurry, hurry, hurry. Okay, uh, first lie. I can't process my feelings because they're ugly. That is religion, okay? Um, it's having it all together, all the answers, being okay, polished. The thing is, sometimes parts of your heart are not okay. Sometimes they're not. Does the Lord not know that? He searches and knows all things. He's not surprised by that. So why am I so afraid? And the, the lie for me came like, what if someone reads this when I would journal? This dumb thing. I don't know if this is anyone else. I would get so paralyzed because it would, <laughs> I'd have this lie that would say, um, your kids are gonna read this. As if like my children and my children's children and my children's children's children are gonna get a hold of my journals and are gonna pour over them and are gonna say, what a heathen great grandma was. <laughs> Can you believe what she went through? <laughs> uh, have any of you guys thought that? They, see, weirdly, we think this and it limited me. I didn't have a single place where I could come and bring my absolute honesty. I was like a politician worried every single word would be counted against me as if I didn't have a strong defense. But the thing is, we have a strong defense in Jesus. I just never put weight on it before. So I can actually live and own my imperfection and my process because he sees me, he believes in me, and because we're not done yet. But he said it is finished, so it will be finished in my life. So all of a sudden, I don't have to be afraid of my process on a page, but I can, I can boldly stand on what Jesus is doing in me, that we're not finished yet, okay? Um, and the thing is, we can't do this legalistic, religious, perfectionistic thing because there's no beauty in it. I think we're all a little tired of whitewashed tombs. We're a little tired of black and white. We want the streaming, sweeping colors of redemption and freedom in our art, right? People are waiting for it. We're tired of cookie cutter, and that's what religion does. So let's get bold, and let's, let's deal with the fact that we're mid-process, but we're loved there. Okay, um, another lie that I faced. It was just a general tone of self-loathing, negativity, being unkind. Uh, a lot of times we will talk to ourselves in a way we would never, ever dream of addressing another human, right? We get sometimes downright abusive. And actually when we create, it's kind of like that can happen pretty quickly. Um, I was in Ireland a couple years ago. I was getting frustrated because I was getting a lot of words about songwriting, um, which normally is nice until you feel like, yeah, but it's not happening and it's not happening and it's not happening. And the Lord showed me this picture of a little three-year-old girl and, and her mother. Um, and the Lord said, Kelly, this three-year-old girl has an heirloom tea set in her name. It's fine porcelain and it's hers. But, but a good mother isn't gonna give her daughter that set at the age of three. Why? Because she doesn't know how to, how to hold it yet, right? What will she do? She'll get a permanent marker. She'll, she'll scratch all over it. She could drop it accidentally. So a good mother saves it up 
till the daughter knows how to carry it. And what he said is, see, Callie, I haven't given them to you yet. Because when you're mean to yourself, it's like you pick up this fine china and you throw it against the wall. So I'm not gonna give it to you because you don't know how to hold it. But I will give you plastic. But it wasn't mean, it was kind. Do you see that it says kindness? I'll give you this, pla this plastic to practice on. It's the parable of the talents dressed up like blue and, and white china, but it's all the same. What are you stewarding now? How are you carrying what you already have? And if you do it with kindness, it makes a way for the prophetic words to come to pass in your life, yeah? Cool, awesome. Um, another lie, real quick, I'm cliche. This one grates on me because it's not actually an accusation against us, it's against God as our maker, right? that he makes something that's cliche. Here's the thing, if you are being honest, if you're owning where you're at and if you're speaking from your current heart, it is impossible for you to be cliche, right? God only custom creates, he never mass produces from a factory line. So I'm sick of that. We're not gonna talk about the Lord like that. You by nature create, you by nature are profound, okay? So God, I'm so sorry for times I, I think that I'm cliche and I'm sorry for agreeing with that. Cool. Another, I'm just running through these so fast, guys. Another lie is the pressure. I hate this one too. Ugh, pressure, you're running out of time. The artist's clock is ticking. It's getting louder every second. Your deadline is fast approaching. The dumb one I've had to deal with, there's not female worship leaders that are that old, Callie. Ooh, here's the thing. Who set a date to artistic relevance? I'm calling it bluff. I'm over it. It's anxiety dressed up like a clock. Have you ever stopped to think that ticking, that motivation, you might think it's ambition, but what's the fruit? Are you enjoying your life? When you get it, are you satisfied? Because if not, it is anxiety and it's stealing from you, right? So what if the metronome of writing wasn't set to anxiety, but the pace of heaven? Where my best days are ahead of me, always, 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 always. So I don't have to rush to check off that bullet point or whatever to prove something about who I am because this is done at a perfect pace, right? He knows the timing of my life and it's always ripe, okay? Uh, the lie that no one cares what I have to think or say, we need to look higher because he has things to say about you. And when you hear what he has to say, it just drowns out the rest of it. People's opinions start to mean less and less and less when you know how obsessed he is with what you create. Uh, the lie, I don't have what it takes. Who qualified you? Your talent, your ability, your writing? You were not your own idea. You are God's idea. He qualifies you and he takes ownership of it. It's the same God who took a stuttering, slurred Moses to confront the political power of the day and bring deliverance to an entire nation. He is the one who qualifies you. It's the same God who qualified a cowering Gideon. And it's the same God who qualified the leading intellectual thinker of the day who, who persecuted the church with a radical life transformation. He was the one who said his impeccable religious resume was nothing compared to the gospel of Jesus because Jesus qualifies us. One lie, it's not worth it. It's when discouragement, visionlessness, and hopelessness get at you. And this can result in laziness and apathy. The thing is, you're actually meant to work. You know that? We were given a garden to tend to before the serpent was there and started talking and we gave into it, right? We're meant to co-labor with God. We just need a vision for why. So once my husband and I, we were, uh, this is so random, we were invited to go to a vineyard, which was great. It was during harvest time um, and I'm out there and not even three minutes in, the Lord starts to talk to me and I'm living a parable. And what he tells me is, Callie, we talk about harvest. We talk about the finished product. We talk about these like grand exploits we're gonna do as if it's like we like lay on this plush red velvet cushion and we just lift our chins and then wine or fruit juice or grape juice. It's just pour it down your throat, right? And we talk about harvest being like that. Harvest, you go out in the field, but it's ripe and it's ready and there's a joy in it. He wants to co-labor with you. So he's not just gonna rip songs out of you, right? You work with him, you get it out because we're meant to work. We're meant to tend a garden and maybe the garden is right here, right? 
So these are some voices that I've heard in my process. Do any of these relate to you guys? Yeah? Here's the thing, there's a lot, I'm sure I'm not hitting. Um, a great rule of thumb is to identify, think carefully about the voices that talk to you. Really carefully. The thing is, so John 10, I love it. It talks about, um, I'm the shepherd and my sheep hear my voice. That means you hear his voice, you can hear his voice. So all of a sudden we get to discern a foreign voice, a bullying voice from the voice of the Father. And all you do is you come at it and you say, God, what lie am I believing? We say around here, if, if not every part of your life is glimmering with hope, glistening with hope, you're believing a lie, right? And so um, how do we begin to identify if it's a lie? If it rushes you, if it gives you anxiety, if it makes you wanna quit, if the general feelings are downcast or I'm, I'm less than I think I am or I'm not whatever, all that kind of stuff, it's not the Father. His voice is only ever kind. It's only ever tender. He only ever believes in you and that's the truth. That's what he sounds like. So get to know his voice and it's pretty clear when these voices come and start talking that they're not him. And then you wage war because he said it's finished. He said these voices get to be done and so they get to be done, right? We need the strongest word over our life, the underpinning of our creativity to be the spinning, laughter-filled, confident voice of the Father. And we need the pace of our life to be set to heaven's metronome, the lull of his voice and the tone of his word over your life. I had a really strong sense that there were like, there were dreams, there were callings, there were things uh, in us that have gone dormant and quiet because we've had critics talking at it for so long. Can any of you guys relate to that? Yeah? We just wanna reawaken those, right? We wanna co-labor with God. We wanna, we wanna see what he set inside of us happen, right? And so the theme, you know, the theme of this worship view is come alive. And for some of you, coming alive might look like looking head on at what you're made to do and saying, okay, I'm gonna stop listening to voices that keep me from it. I'm gonna start honoring it. I'm gonna start treating it with kindness. I'm gonna foster it and I'm gonna get after it again. Yeah? How many of you guys relate to that? I'm gonna have you, yeah, okay. Um, we just have a little bit longer. I just wanna pray. Um, I wanna pray into some of this stuff. How are you guys doing? Good? I just threw a ton at you real fast. Um, that I really, really trust the Holy Spirit's ability to go in and do his job. So actually, I just think there's so much to, um, when we're active participants with, with what God's doing. So if, if any of these lies or if this dream thing, actually, if any of the lies stood out to you, um, that felt relatable, that felt like, yeah, I hear that and I maybe didn't know it or I did know it, but I want it to end today. Why don't you just stand real quick? Okay. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pray real quick. So God, in a moment, this can change. Father, we repent for listening to lies. We repent for leaning in and giving it our ear and giving it our power. God, would you come and turn the volume down on these lies in the name of Jesus? We break their power. We just sever those voice boxes and we say they can speak no longer in the name of Jesus. And God, would you come now and would you start to speak? God, would you minister in these places? Even as you fall asleep, God, would you come and minister at night the truth, the deep truth that needs to be there of what you say, of the truth, God, the reality of how you view things, how you view them, God. So we just say it's done in the name of Jesus. We believe it can be that simple. We borrow your words and we say it is finished today in the name of Jesus. Whatever that lie is, it is finished. So what I want you to do is identify the lie that you've been believing and actually say it out loud and then say, I break agreement, it is finished in the name of Jesus. Can you do that? So just say it out loud. You're all gonna do it, so you're fine. Did you say it? So say with me, it is finished. 
One more, guys, just one more time. Remember, this is MMA, we cast it down, right? It is finished, it's done, it's done, it's done, right? Yeah, okay, and then for those of you who've had dreams that need to be reawakened, why don't you stand up as well? if there's anybody who's not. So just real quickly, God, we say you can let them bubble up again. Callings, come call again. Come call to us. We will answer. We're not gonna shut you down and we're not gonna let voices bully any longer. We will cherish them. God, we're gonna cherish the porcelain that you've given to us. We won't, we won't throw it against the wall. We will handle very, very, very carefully the things that you've entrusted to us. Thanks, God. So God, may this be a breeding ground. What's inside our chest be a breeding ground for dreams to come true and for work to be finished, God. Thanks that we get to co-labor with you. Thanks that harvest is fun and we get to be partakers in what you're doing on the earth. In Jesus' name, amen.